Yeah, yeah first, uh, my, my name is Luca Paul. I, I am the uh, adjunct, adjunct distinguished professor of African, African studies here at the African, African Center. And uh, previously, I was the dean of academic affairs of the African, African Center. Center. I know of the lands is a challenge. I know uh, my <laughs> colleague. Uh, uh, and he said, you are going to ask this to you, but don't do this more. But maybe I will push, push you further, further and please don't give me a slip. And, and if, if it happens, then we will do more exercise. So, so this, this is what we... we... But, but really, I'm so happy the way the program has been going on so far. So, so what I will do before I move to this session, this week, this is the session of the first week. week. The last, last session of the first week. week. And, and it would be good, good really to really connect the dots. dots. And, and I, I want, want to say the first, first week, week, it was meant for you to interact and, and to create a trusted platform so that, that you know each other. other. But, but the, the week, week itself was meant, meant to, to really advance understanding. understanding. How can, How can we be able, able really to analyze the context, context and, and to, to help, help you understand the security landscape of Africa? Africa. And, and I believe during, during the week, we were having a bit of blindness. When <laughs> you were very, very clear, the sea blindness, blindness, how much we, we know about the maritime time But, but even further than, than that, all, all of us who came here, here about the issue of mega trade and, and to what level of understanding of this mega trade and what I'm sure some of you might have improved your understanding and the magnitude of this trade of the mega trade. But if we went further than that, the issue of violent extremism, before the violent extremism, the issue of the, uh, the, the conflict, violent conflict, and what are the drivers to what level can we be able to respond to this violent conflict? And, and then, then violent extremism is a phenomenon, really, really facing all of us, even if, if you are not attached to it, it is likely coming. coming. So, so it's better, better that we, we prefer ourselves, ourselves to, to prevent and, and to, to be well equipped, equipped to respond to it. To it. So, so as national, national organized crime, a big challenge, and, and I, I think it's very important for us to keep our eyes open. And, and I, I think, think I believe the session might have provided you with that understanding of the transnational organized crime. Cyber security threat. Although we are saying that the digitalization of our system is still so we are not really affected. But that session showed us that it is indeed a big threat and we should be aware and prepare ourselves. And I talk about the modern kind of security, but the most important thing, blindness. Of use. And, and I think that's, that's a very important, important although we are aware, but I think the session was so powerful how, how to bring the issue of use to the discourse and the, the way you are really managing and delivering what you deliver the security. And, and then the women is something that we have clear. These are issues cutting across. And, and this morning, democratization, I know, provoked a lot of discussion. This is exactly what we meant to have this trusted platform and we discuss. And, and I'm, I was, was so happy, happy the level of discussion and the question that you have asked. And then now, we'll be we start discussing about the rule of law and, and the uh, security governance. I know whenever we talk about the rule of law, sometimes for the military and the security is a taboo, you know. That so coming again with these concepts, you know, rule of law to limit us. We want, want to act very fast, but here you are bringing us the issue of human rights and the rule of law. We, we decided, decided actually the, the previous the morning session was talking talk about, about the context, context, the bigger context, context of the governance, the issue of democracy. We, we want, want to zoom in to the issue of rule of law. Rule of law is a very, very central to the issue of, of governance, and, and it's, it's a very, very concrete. And in, in fact, fact, when you talk, talk about, about governance in abstract, rule of law is the key for us to move the debate to the institutions and to the leaders. Rule of law is about 
about but social, social content, content, and I know uh, uh, my, my colleague really will talk about, about it. The citizens, the citizens decided to relinquish part of their power, power the, the violence, violence they want to protect themselves. themselves. They, they relinquish this power, give it to the state, state so, so that, that the state can be able, able to act on their behalf, behalf and, and to, to use the, the violence responsibly and accountably. In some times, the state tends to fail. In, in fact, fact, we saw in Africa, Africa that, that the development state centric development or the, 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 the state, the developmental state has failed to deliver human rights, rights and good governance. Even the security centric state failed to deliver even the development and rule of law. In fact, I want to borrow the statement by Kofi Annan that the community cannot enjoy development without security. And the humanity cannot enjoy security without the development. But I cannot even enjoy, enjoy both without human rights. This, this is, is the focus, focus of the day uh, session. I, I hope, hope we'll be able to deliver to you what we want to achieve with this session. But, but let, let me give you the... Uh, Today we are going to have uh, a two, two seasoned uh, panelists who will help us to move our debate around the issue of human rights, I mean the issue of rule of law. So we have uh, uh, Dictor Catherine Kelly. I think you might, some of you might have seen her, I think. And I think that's what introduced. But I think just to be a certain human side of it. Is that, that she's the, uh, the acting, acting dean or the interim dean, but, but she's the, the one who actually provided academic leadership to this, this program. program. And, and we are so appreciative of our leadership. leadership. And, and the, the product we'll see it very, very clearly. A, a friend that is one of a very big asset in the African, African Center. So I don't, I don't want to go into, into her. If, if, if you got, got introduced by then, I was suspected by COVID, I couldn't make it to see you here. But, but the, the other, other one who will be joining us through the uh, virtually, virtually is Brigadier General, General Professor Dan Kowali. Kowali. He, 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 he served as the Malawi Defense Force as, as the Chief of the Legal Services and, and Judge Advocate, Advocate General. General. He, he is extraordinary professor of, of international law and international, international relations at the University, University of Pretoria, and, and a visiting professor at Nunan University in Sweden, where he got, he earned his master's and doctoral degrees in international law. Uh, he has been a fellow also at the Harvard Kennedy School, and currently he's a fellow and a scholar at the United States Army War College uh, in Pennsylvania in the United States. So, so he's a current chairperson of the Malawi National International Humanitarian Law Committee. His, His most recent publication include the use of force for protection of human rights in Africa, and another one on sustainable peace and security in Africa. So these are very quite distinguished uh, people who will be helping us to start the debate. But, but then what do you want to achieve from this session. Three objectives that we would like to achieve. One, to discuss what rule of law is a principle and is a process, and its place in democratic and civil security and security sector governance. And also we, we try to consider the different ways that the rule of law shapes and drives of security, security challenges and, and the mega train affecting the, the continent. And, and the last but not least, to examine the, uh, the strategic, strategic benefits and the practical challenges that the security sector leaders uh, face within, uh, within, within seeking to establish and enhance the rule of law uh, in the security sector and also building trust and relationship with the citizens. 
So, so I, I will start, start with my colleague, colleague uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Kelly, with three, three questions, questions uh, to start, start the debate. The, the first, first question is, what, what is the rule of law? Because as a concept, we need to have a clarity about this concept. And, 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 and what, what are some of the key features of the rule of law that, that make it important for security, security sector, sector effectiveness? And, and the, the second question, because Dr. Kelly did a lot of good work in this area, and, and we would like her to talk about the, the rule, rule of law lies in the heart of many, many challenges and opportunities that African state face in the security domain. domain. Whether, whether she could give us some, some examples of how rule of law shapes the drivers of core security, security threat that, that face Africa. And last, what, what does, does the rule of law, how does, does the rule of law influence the channels, channels to which the risk faces uh, factors for, for, for insecurity, uh, for, for, for insecurity to play out? And, and we, we, hope, we hope that you will give us give some, some examples. Example. Please, Please join me in welcome her to give, give our opening uh, uh, remarks. Please, Please welcome. welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Luca. Hello, Dr. Dan, um, who's joining us online. Um, so I'm here to kick us off for this panel on what the rule of law is, what are some of its key features that make rule of law important for security sector effectiveness. And then I'll talk about some of the trends and, and a few responses if I have time. Um, so in a nutshell, rule of law is both a principle and a process. In terms of principles, Rule of law is the idea that all people are treated equally under the law, regardless of who they are. This, so the rule of law is meant to contrast with rule by law, which is a mode of governing in which those in political power use the law to constrain the behavior of others, but not to constrain themselves. So we're contrasting rule of law with rule by law, first of all, in terms of principle. In terms of process, it's more complex, and there are multiple facets. Rule of law is not just about security and justice officials enforcing the law. It's also about making the equality of everybody under the law a real tangible thing. And so in that sense, building the rule of law is an ongoing social and political process that involves the state, including the security forces, but it also involves citizens. And it hinges upon those state officials forging relationships of trust and reciprocity with the citizens that they're intended to serve. Um, this, this could, could be based, based on relevant local, national, and international standards about rules, about rights, and about ways to seek redress for problems one is facing. So in other words, ensuring the equality of all under the law, not only in principle, but also in practice, is a core part of government establishing and maintaining this social contract with citizens that Dr. Luba just references in his introduction. So to expand a bit on these ideas, rule of law has a variety of key components that make it what it is. And I think that's often why when we talk about rule of law, people can talk past one another because there are multiple facets. There are multiple things we could be talking about, different aspects. So countries with robust rule of law have laws and policies that are clear, that are well known to everybody, and that are internally consistent. So, so that's sometimes referred to in legal circles as legal certainty. This, this is the idea that you can anticipate what the consequences of any given behavior might be as long as you understand what it is that the law says. So, so in that sense, transparency about what the law is and about how it's applied is an important part of this concept. But the content of the law is also matters, of course. I'm sure you were thinking that. Um, countries with robust rule of law have constitutions and legislation that offer equal protection of freedoms and liberties for all citizens. So proportionality, that means um, the degree of punishment being appropriate for the degree of offense in criminal law, for example. Proportionality is also a notable aspect of the law's content here. Some African countries have ratified international conventions that affirm some of these principles I've mentioned already, but we should also turn to what the African commitments are on this. Many countries in the room, we are from, have signed on to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. The African Charter on Democracy, Elections, and Governance also promotes these rule of law principles, like equality, and the exercise of various freedoms and liberties. And so that's an important point, um, I think, for us to underline for this audience of emerging leaders. 
Another aspect of rule of law that matters quite a bit is citizens' practical access to state and non-state options for accessing justice. Um, that's part of the rule of law too. And ideally, every citizen has a range of justice options at their disposal that they can choose to use or not to use if they encounter a particular kind of problem and if they have good knowledge about the pros and the cons of pursuing those different options or choices that they have available. That too is a key part of the rule of law. Finally, I will dwell just for a minute on the extent to which justice institutions operate fairly and independently. That also matters quite a bit, as we heard about this morning already. So countries with robust rule of law systems have checks and balances between the executive branch, the legislature, and the judiciary, as some of you mentioned. This allows the judiciary to function independently of what are often in Africa very strong executive branches of government. That also helps to ensure equitable and consistent application of the law to everybody, whether they're someone who's in the government or someone who's outside of it. And again, I'll go back to some of the African Union reference points here on these principles. The AU's Agenda 2063 advances a vision based on this by calling for an Africa where people, quote, enjoy affordable and timely access to independent courts and a judiciary that delivers justice without fear or favor. So, so to sum up for this beginning part, rule of law prevails when there's a widespread sense that everybody is subject to the rules and there are practical mechanisms in place to ensure that the rules are applied. Leaders are subject to oversight by other leaders in various branches of government. They're also subject to oversight by citizens who are not in government. People also need sufficient access to justice to be able to hold each other to account. And, and that requires a certain degree of fundamental freedoms and liberties that ensure that all citizens are working under the law on a relatively level playing field. So that leads us to the second question of why rule of law, as I'm defining it here for you on the podium today, matters for security sector effectiveness. The short answer is because justice and rule of law are vital for peace and stability, which it is the security sector's job to provide. So that's why you should care. Part of the foundation for peace and stability is a high level of trust between security actors and citizens. Mistrust of security forces can exist for a wide variety of reasons. There are historical legacies of security force abuses. There are perceptions, right or wrong, of institutional corruption. There's frustration with uh, the formal justice system's slow response to crimes in many cases. Security forces can do their jobs better, however, when the people that they are meant to serve trust them. And so fostering this popular confidence in the security sector through promoting this kind of rule of law can hinge upon building rights-respecting relationships with citizens, upon providing citizens adequate human security, uh, which is the whole point of us being here to strategize together, to figure out how to do that um, even more than we already are. It can also depend upon enabling citizens to exercise their rights and express their views peacefully, even if they disagree with the government. And note there, I'm emphasizing peacefully. I'm sure this will come up in the Q&A. Uh, there are not, these are not always easy duties to fulfill, I realize. But as we will hear from others, there are major strategic benefits to the security sector operating in accordance with the rule of law, both internally within defense institutions and externally in terms of their everyday interactions with ordinary citizens. So, so overall, more transparent, legitimate, and accountable security forces in the long run can gain greater trust of the populace and then address the threats and challenges that they're facing in more lasting and sustainable ways. Now, rule of law and security were frequently at odds in the early post-independence period in many African states, which we alluded to a bit in the morning as well. This, um, earlier on, the main kind of security that concerned leaders was security of the regime itself. And the, and the focus, focus on regime security, security meant structuring the security and defense services to minimize the risk of coups and, and to wield coercive power against citizens to keep violent and peaceful challenges to authority in check. check. So, so that's, that's part, part of what can lead sometimes to popular distrust in the security services um, or, or in the state justice system. Um, either or both can be issues and of course it differs across country. country. Um, in, in any, any case, case, more recently, recently African, African national security, security agendas have diversified, 
And on the AU, regional, and national levels, there's growing emphasis, as we all know, on citizen security, which hinges upon state security officials forging relationships with the populace based on this legitimacy, this transparency, this accountability that we've started talking about here in the seminar. So through this lens, I would, I would say rule of law matters for security in many ways, but there are two that merit emphasis here, and then I'll go into greater detail on now. First, rule of law shapes the drivers of some of the core threats that African states face. And second, rule of law influences the channels through which risk factors for insecurity might play out. So rule of law influences megatrends, which of course influence security. So, so let me, let me just, just spend five, five minutes on a few um, rule of law issues that are drivers of insecurity in several, several different contexts. Um, on, on violent extremism, you know, human, human rights abuses by security sector actors, perceptions of unjust treatment by government, by by government officials on the part of citizens, are key determinants of individuals' decisions to join violent extremist groups. We've seen this based on research that's been done in the Sahel, in, in the Lake Chad, Chad Basin, and, and in the Horn of Africa. So there, there is one famous study, I believe we assigned in the syllabus, from 2017 by the UNDP. This, this was, was done in Cameroon, Kenya, Kenya Niger, Niger, Nigeria, Somalia, and Sudan. Sudan. And, and the study, study compared, it's very interesting, interesting methodologically, it compared the life histories of people who had joined violent extremist organizations with, with the life histories of people who had chosen not to join a violent extremist group, who had faced that choice but decided not to. And by comparing those groups, the study sought to identify the tipping point that pushed particular individuals into joining a group. And 71% of people who participated in that study who joined violent extremist organizations said that the tipping point was state security forces killing, arbitrary jailing, or abusing a family member or a friend. Another study by International Alert, an NGO, focused on the Liptako Gurma region in the Sahel, concluded that the principal push factor leading youth in particular to join violent extremist groups was the experience or perception of abuses perpetrated by various elements of the state. So not just the security forces, um, but, but state, state officials more generally. So, so perceptions that state officials act with bias or impunity can exacerbate grievances, and state actors doing counterterrorism or CVE risk exacerbating these grievances if they hold suspects in arbitrary detention, commit violence against suspects while they're in detention, or even profile members of certain ethnic groups as suspects. So those are some key issues in the violent extremism arena. Um, I, I probably, probably don't, don't have time to talk, talk about um, armed conflict and violence as well as transnational organized crime. So I'll go to transnational organized crime, but I think there are certainly things one could say about the rule of law drivers um, that contribute, though may not actually cause armed conflict and violence. So I'm happy to talk in the Q&A if that makes sense on that. So to talk for a minute about transnational organized crime dynamics though. Today, as, as we discussed on Tuesday, Transnational organized crime in Africa is perpetrated by a variety of actors. So we talked about foreign entities, we talked about criminal networks, we talked about mafia-style groups, but also certain, though not all of course, high-level officials within African states whose, whose uh, work may facilitate, in some cases, the work of criminal networks. So this is perhaps one of the most sensitive aspects of transnational organized crime in Africa. It's this uh, the, the way, way that high-level government corruption can enable it in certain, certain cases. And, and this, this has been documented through sources like those that Mr. Martin showed us, the Act Organized Crime Index, and a variety of other sources. This, this is true around the world. It's not just about um, how this works in Africa. But, but there, there are recent examples from several African countries. And in, in one case, I'm not going to name names, it was, it was that security officials and diplomats from a particular country were implicated in transnational drug trafficking. In, in another case that's been widely documented, it was that government leaders were found to be colluding with illicit trafficking networks. Now, now why does this matter for the rule of law? It matters because organized crime is easier to perpetrate when there are fewer guardrails against corruption in government. So when the law is not applied evenly and institutions of transparency and accountability are relatively weak, then 
government, government officials colluding, colluding with criminal, criminal networks, networks will have, have little to fear. fear. And, and so, so problems, problems can arise if states, states choose not to enforce the laws on transnational cr organized crime or avoid shining light on the big fish in, 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 in government who are facilitating the perpetration of some of these acts. acts. So, so these kinds of practices, practices I'm describing here subvert the fundamental principle that nobody is above the law. law. And, and so, so that's why it matters for rule of law. Um, um, a, a second, second way that rule of law, of law is really critical to security is that it shapes some of these mega trends we talked about in the first day of this program. program. It, it shapes the ways that continental mega trends are influencing African countries' risk and resilience profiles. So, so let's look, for example, example at, at urbanization and demographic growth. growth. So, so as, as we've said, said already uh, in, the in the course, in the, in the coming, coming decades, decades, over 80% of Africa's, Africa's population growth is expected, expected to take place in cities. And, and this has contributed to a rapid expansion of informal settlements in many, many of Africa's urban, urban areas. areas. And I remember some of you brought this up in the Q&A from the start here. So, so along with this, there is a rising number of slum dwellers in urban Africa, Africa who live in often in precarious legal and economic conditions. That, that can, can leave, leave them also vulnerable to heavy-handed treatment by security forces who are trying to do their job, they're trying to counter crime and violence. But low levels of trust in the police, low access to relevant customary or state forms of justice, and insecurity and land tenure even, can constrain slum dwellers' enjoyment of the economic and social rights that are fundamental parts of the rule of law. So the, so the legitimacy, legitimacy of state, state institutions and, and people's willingness to respect the laws the state, state is laying out also depends on how security personnel are relating to the people living and working under these conditions of informality and, and whether residents of all socioeconomic strata in society consider these state actors to be accountable. So that's one example. I'll, I'll do one more. African security futures will also be shaped by the youth bulge. And, and that youth bulge, as we've discussed, is projected, projected to foster a 50% increase in population in Africa by 2035. Youth are frequently underrepresented in formal economies and in policy-making processes. And, and at the same time, they play key roles in mobilizing civic movements that are seeking to combat corruption. They play key roles in uh, movements that are trying to strengthen local governance. And they play key roles in peacefully challenging presidents who try to defy term limits. So, so the increased activism by Africa's growing youth movement is largely focused on, uh, I wouldn't, I don't know about largely, but frequently focused on matters of justice, at least in some part. So um, they, they may be focused on mediating conflicts in their communities, challenging term limits and presidents who defy them, promoting various forms of civic engagement and citizenship. And um, I've, I've heard this phrase a little bit, um, in Senegal. Citizens Room, Burkina Faso, Lucha, and the Democratic Republic of Congo have set some notable examples that make the news even over here in the U.S. Um, through peaceful protest. But these movements are certainly not the only form, by any means, of youth engagement in advocating for justice and rule of law. Rural youth are equally critical interlocutors for mediating disputes or preventing conflict in their communities. Um, whether uh, I've seen this done um, in, in some, some of my past work, um, I used to work for the American, American Bar Association's non-governmental organization called the Rule of Law Initiative that did work all over the continent. We've seen, I've, I've seen, seen through that personally, um, youth serving as community mediators in Mali um, for disputes um, um, related to governance in the North. We have, we have seen youth playing key roles as community paralegals who spread knowledge about different justice options and how to access different forms of justice in countries like DRC or Central African Republic, Mali, Mauritania. Um, and, and so, um, you know, youth play a multifaceted role here that relate to justice and the rule of law. Um, so I think that also means that inclusive policy making for youth is a key rule of law element of preventing exclusion and, and furthering the, the peaceful civic, civic engagement of youth. Now, now Dr. Luca, do I have time to talk about just a couple of examples of how policy responses have brought in rule of law? Yes. yes. Okay. okay, I'll, I'll take, take just a couple of minutes to go back to some examples. Um, I, I think there are really, really good examples from the continent on how one can infuse rule of law into response to some of these challenges. 
So, so um, one, one that uh, we have remarked upon, um, and I think has been mentioned in here, are joint permanent commissions. This, this is something you see often in the Southern African uh, region. Uh, uh, joint, joint permanent commissions that meet um, bilaterally, but usually between two countries, I believe, um, including that include security ministers and justice ministers to discuss some of these key security issues on an extremely high level. Um, including justice ministers along with the security ones help to diffuse um, the way that these different uh, issues play out together in providing a response. In Niger over the last few years, um, in terms of responding to violent extremism, a coordination committee was put together on terrorism and transnational organized crime. And the goal of it was to improve respect for human rights in the criminal justice chain. And so the Supreme Court justices in Niger initiated this idea of an enhancing communication between chiefs of defense services and defense staff and uh, those who are in charge of justice in the country so that there's more communication between the point with which the military is out there fighting and they capture a suspect, they transfer them to either the gendarmerie pivotal or police. The law enforcement entities then need to communicate well with the prosecutors in order, in order to uh, make, uh, make sure that rights are respected throughout this criminal justice chain so that if, if there is an opportunity to prosecute suspected offenders, human rights and rule of law have not been violated in the process of getting to that point. And then, and then of course, course the, the idea there is that the justice system should ideally be serving as a deterrent mechanism for engaging in these kinds of behaviors. Um, but, but if the chain doesn't work, then the process doesn't work as well. Um, I, I think in the maritime, maritime domain, we've got, got the Interregional Coordination Center on Maritime uh, Transnational Organized Crime, crime that focuses a lot, a lot on legal harmonization, so just matters, matters here quite a bit, quite a bit in relation to security. security. And I'll give, and I'll give one maybe more. one more. Okay. Okay. Um, one, one more, I will go to the community level. level. There are a, there are a lot, lot of great community, community level, level endeavors, endeavors as well. As well. Um, um, one, one is um, um, legal empowerment. Legal empowerment. Um, so these, um, so these community, community paralegal models, models that we see being used across, across the continent, the continent Sierra Leone, Leone and Liberia, Liberia have used, used this model. model. DRC, Central, Central African Republic, Republic used this model. model. Of, um, um, providing, providing um, training, people training people on the local level in their, level, in their own communities spread, spread the word, the word about, about different justice, justice options, options for dispute resolution, resolution, resolution within, within their communities and, community and potentially even accompanying, accompanying people who are unfamiliar with different parts of the justice system, system and connecting, connecting with which, which kind, kind of, of uh, justice, justice a, solution. a solution. They want they to want seek, seek for whatever problem they're having, having and accompanying them through the process, especially if they're choosing to go to a state court. And then this familiarizes the citizens within, within an institution and, and allows for, for um, potentially, potentially for uh, those, in those in the state to link up, to link up with citizens, citizens for some of this some trust, trust that may be missing, sometimes, missing sometimes, sometimes to be built. Um, um, there, are there are plenty of other examples um, of, dialogue of dialogue and mobile, mobile ports, ports on the local level that all leave us there. there. I, I, know, I know at least at from, least the, from uh, the from uh, from our presentation, the idea really to to give you the the. The basic, the basic understanding, understanding of the, of the uh, rule of law of course is a concept, concept that we may need to really zooming, zooming in and, and make it very very operational. operational. And I think, and I think very, very much at least. But the most, but the important, most important thing, thing even linking, linking the, uh, the, uh, the rule of, the rule of law to the, to the, to the, the mega trends and the, and the drivers of conflict on the continent. And, and really, um, Dr. Kowale, I think based on what uh, uh, Dr. Kelly uh, mentioned, to provide us the context, we want, we want really to move in for a specific, specific example that, that the participant can benefit from. One, we would really like you to provide an example from your own work in Malawian Defense Forces that, that will show us the strategic gains that the security leaders enjoy when they bring the issue of rule of law into their work on security challenges. Because this is very important, it's one thing to define it. How can, can, how can I make a difference um, based, based on your experience? experience. And, and you, could you also speak uh, uh, about the Malawi, uh, um, the way that the Malawi is still working to improve the rule of law. It is a work in progress, uh, but it would be good to highlight what level uh, the uh, Malawi is, uh, is, is, is working on these, bringing the rule of law into the security sector to be and, and the second, second one, uh, uh, Professor Sakwale, is the uh, examples, because, because I think the participant here would like really to give us concrete examples that they can be able to help, help them in their work. Uh, and, and could you explain how national level oversight institutions 
um, um, like like, like the, um, the the parliament, the the, the, uh, the uh, and the human rights, rights and anti-corruption commission can enhance check and, and balances between the, the security, security sector and citizen. And I think the, the morning session we talk about issues, the democracy is about check and balance. And, and I, I think the rule of law is a tool with which we can operationalize the, the democracy. And, and the last but not least, again, we would like you, I'm going to do the case of Malawi. And I think it was mentioned in the morning. Um, uh, uh, using the example from Malawi, could you discuss current efforts by state security officials to build trust with citizens through local work with non-state actors to enhance transparency and accountability? And these are the pillars of the rule of law. I think we want to move the debate from the national to the local level. And how can that would make a difference? So. So, 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 so to talk, uh, well, well, please, you, you have 15 to 20, 20 minutes. minutes. You are most welcome. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, uh, sir. And uh, just, just to uh, carry, carry on, on from, from where my colleague, uh, Dr. Kelly, stopped. But before that, uh, let me just uh, say greetings to the uh, distinguished colleagues. And uh, I would also like to congratulate them for being selected as uh, future leaders by their countries and uh, especially to be given the opportunity to attend this prestigious uh, course. So let's take a deep dive to address the questions that uh, the moderator has uh, posed. Uh, like I said, I would like to uh, really uh, move on from where uh, Dr. Kelly stopped. So why should the security sector uphold the rule of law? We've heard about the strategic advantages. Of course, I will emphasize on that in due course, but let's first address the question, why we in the security sector should uphold the rule of law? So, you know, uh, like uh, uh, Kat has mentioned, rule of law means that uh, all citizens should be subjected to the law of the land. So the law of the land, the supreme law of the land is the constitution and uh, all the laws that fall under the constitution are supposed to be observed by each and every person who is within the territory of a state, whether a citizen or a foreigner. So that's what uh, rule of law entails. And rule of law also means that uh, all the three branches of government should be subjected to public accountability. We all know that we have uh, three branches of government, the executive, which are uh, supposed to initiate policy, parliament or legislature, which makes laws, and the judiciary, which enforces the law. That also establishes the principle of separation of powers. The essence of the principle of separation of powers is that these three branches should be checking on each other. So the principle of checks and balances is also key to uh, ensuring that uh, we are upholding rule of law. Now, rule of law applies to everyone, elected officials, as well as uh, public officials, and even uh, citizens. So for elected officials, public accountability entails that they have an obligation to account for their actions, as well as in actions to the people who voted them into office. So both acts and omissions. If the government is supposed to do something and they don't, they are still supposed to explain to the public while they haven't done so. The rationale, as we'll see in due course, is uh, the notion of uh, uh, social contract, which the moderator uh, mentioned. So for appointed officials, rule of law means that uh, they are answerable to the general public in the discharge of their public functions. One of the rationale is that uh, you, know, you are paid by the government, you use public funds, so you have to be answerable to the, to the one. They, there is an English uh, saying that says, he who pays the piper calls the tune. So you cannot just be calling your own tune if uh, you receive money from the public purse. So the true function of public accountability should not be focusing on the negative aspects uh, of uh, the public uh, officials or the elected officials, rather, it should be whether they are exercising their authority in good faith and within the limits of the law. 
Now, uh, let me just highlight uh, on the evolution of the security sector uh, generally. So you'd agree with me that uh, since the implosion of the Soviet empire in uh, 1992, there's been a shift from uh, focusing on state security to a broader concept of security, which we all know as uh, human security. Now, this, uh, uh, the end of the Cold War brought with it uh, new uh, actors. So we are moving away from uh, traditional actors to non-traditional actors. So the judiciary now is regarded as part of the security sector. Same is uh, the civil society, which includes the media. So when we'll be talking about governance to address the question that uh, the uh, moderator has posed, you need to bear this in mind that uh, when you talk about security, we talk we're discussing both uh, the traditional actors as well as uh, the non-traditional actors. Now, you see that uh, most uh, security institutions in our country still operate in silos rather than in an integrated way. And this poses a challenge uh, in the provision of security, apart from the obvious fact that uh, you compete for, uh, for mega resources in the budget, but also there is duplicity of uh, efforts. So if the military does stuff and the police is not aware, you'll be doing the same law enforcement mechanism. So uh, just flag that as uh, one of the issues that we'll be uh, focusing on. Now, the reason why uh, this is a challenge, you see that politics is at the heart of this joint, uh, disjointed operations uh, by uh, the security actors. So policy is supposed to govern the, or to guide the operations of uh, security actors. But uh, in our countries, you see that we don't even have a security policy or a national security policy. So uh, politics and not policy or the law uh, governs uh, our activities. And that is a challenge for uh, rule of law. Now, the existence of individual and informal or semi-formal groups, including political party cadres uh, who are engaged in security activities also poses a risk to public authorities and other individuals, especially when it comes to upholding the rule of law. And uh, upholding the rule of law entails accountability of the security sector as no one is above the law. Uh, most constitutions in uh, almost all the democratic countries on the continent of Africa have a provision which provides for uh, the rule of law, meaning no one should be above the law or no institution should be above the law. I was also requested to address the question of accountability uh, for the security sector, because uh, as you may have known by now, public accountability is one of the key principles of rule of law. So public accountability of the security sector uh, goes to the heart of uh, the uh, security organs. Oversight exists at uh, uh, the executive level because uh, the executive is uh, headed by the president and the president usually is also the commander in chief of uh, the security entity. So there is oversight at that point, but also the budget is initiated by the executive. Of course, it has to be passed by parliament. So you see that uh, part of the executive playing a part on accountability. Added to that, top military officials, even the inspector general uh, of police would be appointed by ex the executive, more importantly, by the president. So again, that is um, an, over, uh, an oversight function. In Malawi, for example, you see that uh, the president, who usually is also the minister of defense, is a head of what we call the Defense Council. So Defense Council is an oversight body of the military, which makes policy, but also oversees operations of the Defense Council or of the uh, Malawi Defense Force. Now, all the promotions are supposed to be approved or endorsed by uh, the Defense Council. The operations are supposed to be scrutinized by the Defense Council because members of the Defense Council are accountable to the Parliamentary Committee on Defense and Security, which is a function of, um, of the legislature. So you see the checks and balances there. The point I'm trying to make here is that uh, the Malawi Defense Force 
is answerable to the defense council. Now the defense council, even where the president sits, is also accountable to the parliamentary committee on defense and security. Now, if uh, both the defense council and the parliamentary committee mess up, then the issue can be taken to the court to question the legality of that particular act. So now you see how the concept of uh, checks and balances uh, works in practice. Now, apart from the executive, you also have judiciary and uh, legislature. I've already mentioned uh, the roles of these uh, functions. So these play a key oversight mechanism. That's the first layer. The second layer is um, the extra parliamentary oversight uh, by uh, public institutions. So you see that uh, there is, uh, in Malawi, for example, there is the Anti-Corruption Bureau, there is the Office of the Ombudsman, and there is also a Human Rights Commission. So these bodies are mandated. Uh, the Anti-Corruption Bureau looks at uh, issues of bribery and uh, prevention of co corruption, whereas uh, Ombudsman looks at maladministration. So by maladministration, I mean where decisions are made contrary to the law. One can go and complain to the ombudsman who is like the public defender. So him or her can actually question the Malawi Defense Force or the police or the uh, correctional services. Uh, and apart from that, if the issue relates to violation of human rights, then the Human Rights Commission has been given a mandate by the constitution to also look at uh, the respect of human rights. So that's uh, the uh, second layer of um, uh, accountability or oversight, uh, public bodies. And then there is another layer whereby you see security agencies also providing operational oversight. So my Malawian colleagues, uh, Keno Malua, for example, will agree with me that uh, we do have the Inspector General of the Malawi Defense Force within the Malawi Defense Force. And I'm um, pretty certain, I think Zambia also has an inspector general, same is the case with South Africa. So most of us just look at uh, the inspector general as being responsible for auditing of finances. But the roles and functions of uh, the inspectorate general of the defense force goes beyond that. They look at operational readiness, but they also look at the uh, conduct of the institution, including discipline. So that's another layer of uh, uh, operational oversight within. Then there is a fourth layer whereby now you have the civil society. Why the civil society? Because these are the representatives of uh, the citizens, of the individuals. They don't have a mandatory or uh, a legal or uh, what, what I'm trying to say is that they are not provided for by the law as a, an oversight mechanism. But because these are representatives of the people and power in a democracy is given to the people, that's why the civil society has that mandate now to also oversee. So they can be whistleblowers in terms of corruption activities. They can be whistleblowers in terms of human rights violations. So that them too play an important but underrated uh, function in terms of uh, upholding the rule of law. Now, democratic oversight of the security sector is a key requirement for public accountability. Why? Because that's what democracy demands. Democracy, as you're aware, is government by the people and for the people. So I already explained the rationale why the security sector should be accountable to the people. Now, the one key takeaway is that multi-level oversight improves compliance with the law and policy, as well as uh, efficiency. So the, by multi-level oversight, I'm trying to highlight the four levels of oversight that I just mentioned. Number one, the constitutional. Number two, public. Number three, internal oversight. Number four, uh, civil society oversight. So if you have multi-level oversight, that means you improve efficiency, uh, you uphold professionalism, you also be transparent, just like uh, Dr. Kelly mentioned, and more importantly, you have the trust of the, pop of the populace, of the people. Uh, my, my, my good friend, uh, Dr. Kelly, made uh, a very good point on that. I don't have to uh, overemphasize. 
But what is key is that uh, because the military is usually mandated with the function of upholding the constitution or defending the constitution, which means they have an extra responsibility by the public to, to be trusted by the public. Once the public loses trust in the military, then we'll go to the chaos uh, what uh, Kat just mentioned. So what are the challenges of uh, security sector governance? I'll be focusing on um, Malawi, a country which I know very well, but I also making, uh, making, I'll also be making references to uh, countries like the US, of, of course, uh, uh, Zambia, South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, uh, because of the interactions uh, within the region. So policing protests is uh, one of the security sector governance uh, that most countries are facing. You know, the constitution provides a bill of rights where individuals have a right to protest, a freedom of assembly. Now, because uh, most uh, members of the police are not trained, so they usually respond to protests with uh, a heavy hand instead of sharpening their skills, instead of uh, having proper training and equipment. So, in a democracy, you need to know that people are allowed to protest. Now, if you need to respond to that, you need to raise your game. That's why we are here attending this course to understand that uh, rule of law is, entails that we are not above the law. So we cannot say people are not supposed to protest. They can protest, but we need now to align our training and equipment to be able to respond to avoid unlawful assembly or uh, riotous uh, uh, enjoyment of uh, uh, the freedom of assembly. The second point is uh, that of professionalism. Professionalism uh, uh, in this case is both ways, within the military itself or the police, but also from the outside. So you have political influence, for example, where individual uh, politicians would be making calls to individual soldiers uh, or, or officers to basically influence them, to, to, to make decisions in favor of a political party or in favor of a particular politician. Apart from that, you see that uh, politicians or people who are in power would, uh, pre would, uh, would actually uh, have their dependents or children recruited just because of uh, that influence. So that is... Uh, uh, political influence, which to a great extent also touches on professionalism. I've always said that professionalism starts at the moment you are recruiting a soldier or you are recruiting an officer. Because if he or she knows that uh, they've been recruited, not because of merit, but because of political connection, that particular mentality will be with that particular uh, individual up to retirement. So we need to ensure that uh, we are professional. How do we do that? We need to avoid political influence. How do we do that? We need to have a code of conduct that provides for integrity, that provides for uh, members of uh, the security organs to be apolitical. By being apolitical, it means you don't have to take sides. I, I wrote a certain uh, blog uh, the past couple of weeks where I was uh, talking about how to counter coups uh, on the African continent. And my last statement was that uh, we as the military cannot lean to the left or to the right. We need to stand upright. So prof that's what it means to be professional. Now, another aspect is um, uh, absence of policy or on correctional services. I'm bringing this point deliberately because uh, we tend to overlook the prison services when you're talking about security. Now, here is uh, the logic. If you have uh, a law enforcement uh, or a police arresting uh, a criminal, that particular criminal goes to court, they are charged, they are convicted, and they're sentenced to prison. Now, after serving, say, 14 years, that particular person comes out of prison, he commits an offense again, are we 
are we uh, on course in terms of uh, correctional services? The answer obviously is we're not. Why? Because our prisons are hardening criminals and not reforming criminals. Why? Because uh, the military, the police, the judiciary, and the correctional services are working in silos. So you as security uh, actors, you need to be looking at these issues from a holistic point of view. Granted, you are a law enforcement officer, granted you are a military officer, but our key role is provision of security. So you cannot just be looking at uh, security from a narrow angle, you need to look at a security from a broader perspective. Why? Because now the focus is on human security. The other issue is a politicization, especially of the national intelligence services where instead of recruiting professionals, we are recruiting political cadres. Now, National Intelligence Service is the easiest and uh, it can actually be a multiplier effect for security. Let's take an example of Mozambique. If you have a National Intelligence Service in Mozambique and you're recruiting political cadres, it means you are depriving yourself of uh, looking at uh, uh, the impact of activities in Malawi for economic growth in Mozambique. You are also not having the advantage of getting information on the activities of uh, the terrorists in Cabo Delgado, you know? Why? Because you have people who have no clue about security. So National Intelligence Services should have uh, a proper professionals because it's key. They are focusing on human security, which is security in the country. Then there is a, a sticky question of upholding constitutional order. Most of our militaries have the mandate of upholding constitutional order. I will cite an example uh, in Malawi, for example, in 2020, 2012, when uh, the then president died in office. So, the political party of the deceased president wanted the brother of the president to take over uh, from the deceased brother as if it was succession or inheritance. Now, uh, that political party was at loggerheads with the vice president at that time, and they did not want her to take, uh, to take over. So the political party of the deceased president reached out to members of the Malawi Defense Force to say, look, we need to take over government. The brother has to take over government. So we pose question to say, what is your basis? Said, at the constitution, where in the constitution? So we pointed to the relevant provisions of the constitution. We said, uh, the, according to the constitution, according to sec section 83 of the Malayan constitution, the vice president has to take over. And our role, one of the key roles of the Malawi Defense Force is to uphold the constitutional order and uh, help uh, civil authorities in the discharge of their functions. So we said, no, no, no. As far as we're concerned, we will do, uh, we, uh, power has to be handed over to the vice president. Now I'm mentioning this because you see that most of the members, the key personnel who are making that decision have done this course that you are doing. So when we talk about professionalism, it does not come from heaven. It starts from this uh, discussions that we're talking about. Then uh, there is also an issue of, uh, so let, let me just explain what do we mean by upholding constitutional order? So upholding constitutional order is uh, performing our functions without violating the rights of individuals and also not frustrating the will of the people. So not frustrating the will of the people. Let me cite an example of Malawi again uh, in 2020 when, uh, when uh, the courts had announced the elections on, a, on, on the basis that uh, they were rigged. So the court ordered fresh elections in Malawi. And uh, we as the military assisted in uh, running that election because we could not frustrate the will of the people. Added to that, during the hearing of the case, because it was a protracted case, the military provided the security to the judges because uh, the civil society in Malawi could not trust the police at that time. So that was part of us 
uh, upholding constitutional order because we could not frustrate the will of the people. So the point I'm trying to emphasize here is that uh, these things do not come in uh, clear cut packages. You need to discern, you need to broaden your understanding. And that's why the moderator asked me to, to provide more examples so that uh, you can uh, understand how it works. Then we also have a quite a problem of uh, understanding the democratic control of the security sector. My, my colleagues, again, will agree with me that uh, in the 2020, we had a very challenging year in Malawi at that time, where the president whose uh, victory was announced by, uh, by, by, by the courts decided to remove one of uh, the commissioners at that time from the, of, of, the, of police. But the commissioner went to court to say, no, you do not have the mandate to remove me from my office in this manner. So they argued that no, we have a democratic control of the security sector. We said, no, no, your control does not mean you need to usurp the law or contravene the law. So we need to understand this. In short, we, illegal orders cannot be obeyed. So we as professionals, we should not be obeying uh, illegal orders. Now in winding up, what are the key takeaways? Number one, Security sector is equally subject to the law and oversight institutions. I've already mentioned that the security sector now is broadened. We should not just be looking at the police and the military. We need to look at uh, the other actors as well. The security sector should construct an institutional framework that nature's professionalism, independence in the security sector by preventing direct uh, control uh, uh, or political control over the security organs. So the onus is not on politicians alone. It is also on us, the military and the police to have an, an institutional framework that promotes uh, professionalism. So in Malawi, the way we do it, uh, we, we teach security sector governance is part of uh, the core courses uh, in the promotion of, uh, of an officer. And uh, it is also part of uh, the promotional exams, especially when you are being considered to be promoted from the rank of uh, captain to major, you need to answer key questions in security sector governance. So you need to understand why, what is the principle of, uh, uh, of uh, democratic control of the security sector? Let me just also expand on that one. Sometimes you may hear the concept of a civilian control of the military, but that is an old uh, phrase these days because we're looking at democratic control, not really civilian control. Of course, civilian control entails democratic control. And we're not just focusing on the military, we're focusing on the security sector as a whole. That's why I'm using the term democratic control of the security sector and not civilian control of the military. Apart from that, in Malawi, we have institutionalized civil military relations because um, one of the reasons why we have challenges in terms of rule of law or upholding rule of law is because uh, the military and the civil society do not interact. The military wants to be feared the civilians think the military are there just to wait for war. But you know that's not the only role of the military. So how do you do that? You need to enhance the relationship. As you are aware, there are two ways of um, enhancing the relationship of a civil military uh, framework. Number one is that formal part. So the formal part would be having a parliamentary committee on defense and security which promotes uh, the relationship between the two. And uh, the budgets, budgets are not made by the military. They have to be made by civilians. So that is also uh, an example of the formal part. And then there is an informal aspect. For example, you see uh, the military uh, team, football teams or soccer teams taking part in uh, civilian uh, uh, football uh, leagues. That's a way of uh, promoting civil military relations. There was a case in Malawi where a military uh, team beat up civilians in a civilian team. So I said, gentlemen, 
Why are you doing this? You are defeating the whole purpose of civil military relations. So that's why it is important to discuss these issues and also more importantly, to understand why we do them. Then uh, I'm saying that uh, security sector governance training should also target civil authorities. I mentioned about how we've done it in Malawi uh, in the Malawi Defense Force, but we should also extend it to civil authorities, especially members of parliament, politicians, even uh, people who work in the Ministry of Defense and uh, related institutions, so that they understand their roles and responsibilities, and more importantly, their limits. Finally, such training should not just be limited to strategic leaders but also to uh, members at the operational and tactical levels. So my request to you, dear colleagues, is that um, when you go back home, make sure you have training of trainers, make sure you have courses. Some of you are company commanders, some of you are battalion commanders. You need now to have, to impart your knowledge, the skills and knowledge that you've learned here to the people, to, to, you know, to, to your, uh, to your colleagues at the operational and tactical level because they are the ones who need it most. And we can only have a multiplier effect if we have such kind of training on the continent and in our units. Apart from that, I'll be happy to take questions and uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you and uh, for your time. Yeah, um, really, um... Uh, 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 Professor, Professor uh, Kowali, you really, you really managed, managed to bring down the issue of rule of law with a practical, practical example from Malawi. But, but indeed, you managed, managed to send, send a very key messages to, the, uh, to, 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 to ourselves and, and to the security sector uh, uh, leaders. I, I think, think one of the key things that, that we have highlighted is that the rule of law if it is brought to the security sector, it is for the benefit of the security sector. It will enhance the relationship with the citizen. It will as well improve the legitimacy of the security sector. Always there is this gap between the civilian and the, uh, and the, uh, and the military. This mistrust, if we bring in the rule of law, that is going to be people-centered, I think this is a very then is going to enhance the performance of the uh, of the security actors. So it is for good of the security actors to embrace the rule the rule of law. We have provided a very important example also. That I think it's very important about how the uh, uh, and I like your term the issue of the uh, the, the dilemma. And I I use it in my discussion group. And, and I know uh, uh, Dr. Renee will, will highlight it more on issue of the professionalism. The, the challenge of politicization of the military and, and the militarization of politics. And, and that, that is the one putting, putting really the, you, the, the security actors, in a, in a very difficult situation. situation. And, and I think that is good you really highlighted very, very, very well. One, One thing I want also to highlight what he said, said what you, what you highlighted, the, the difference between civilian control and, and the democratic control. It, it makes a hell of a difference. A, a civilian control could, could become an autocratic one. But, but you as leaders in the security sector, you are really accountable to the, uh, the, civilian, the civilian, the democratic control of, of civilian. And, and these are very important. important. And, and I think what you said also, that, that the military and the security, security sector, they do indeed play a very important role in, in, in advancing not only the rule of law, but, but even the, the issues of democracy. democracy. 